Hello, everyone. I am Kimberly Pruitt. I'm the medical director for Albuquerque Fire. I'm going to do my best today to fill in for uh, Chief Ortiz here, guiding the discussion with uh, upgraded Lieutenant Orlando Martinez. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And then uh, Ben Rubin. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Thank you for being here, you guys. This is a really interesting call, which has generated a lot of discussion for us yes, already. Yes, We've gone uh, back and forth a couple times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you guys are on Medic 3 together. So this is one of our atypical kind of rescues with a paramedic driver. Yeah. Upgraded. Upgraded. You know, so. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So Medic 3, you're dispatched to a 30 Alpha for a male who with a possible broken leg. What are you guys thinking on your way to this call? What's your general approach on the way? Uh, I think, you know, like it. Being a, a 30 Alpha, you know, like you take for granted, like the Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta system, uh, 30 Alpha. So we jumped this call for the engine in the first place, coming back from a call in 11. And you never know like what it can be. Like it's a broken leg, doesn't specify what part of the leg or anything like that. So there's a lot of things, I think, running through your mind as as far as that and We'll see when we get there, I guess. What to expect yeah. when you get there. And what did you see so. when you got there? So you found a 22-year-old male. Yeah, so we were met by mom and dad uh, outside. They walked us in, and this 22-year-old male is laying on the bed. And obvious pain. You know, you can tell when somebody's in pain. Obvious pain laying on the bed. Uh, so I, Ben starts his assessment, and I'm trying to get uh, – kind of some kind of current history from the parents and making sure the uh, repeat stuff was still the same, that nothing had changed. So Okay. And what kind of history things did you learn before we get to Ben's assessment? Uh, he was on, he had anxiety, uh, depression. Uh, he was an opioid user. Uh, I think those are the some Only major three. things yeah. okay and then ben while he was gathering the history and trying to get a little bit more of the picture what what did you see as you were starting to do your assessment well i know his his parents were concerned about a possible like back or neck injury uh, as well as the leg injury they had told us that's why they didn't try to move him or you know get him into the car to go pov or anything like that so just started with the head um, made sure that his C-spine was clear, that he could turn his head without pain. He wasn't complaining of anything anywhere other than his leg. Um, so just a quick head to toe, got the vital signs set up. And then let's see. Did he have a story of, it was initial dispatch for a broken leg, right? right Did he have yeah. a story of why the <laughs> leg hurt? There's so, a couple. Yeah. He, he was a little bit inconsistent about his story. To, to me, he had told me that he woke up on the ground with leg pain and that he had suspected he had like rolled out of bed and and possibly broke his leg on the fall. Um, and then I believe to Orlando, he had talked about getting up to get some water and tripping and falling and breaking his leg that way or, or injuring his leg that way. Um, so we, yeah, so I, I wasn't sure exactly, but. Did um, the leg look broken to you? At what, first, what was your picture of the so, leg? So when he was first lying, I want to say he was lying on his side, um, his left side. And it was hard for me to tell. Um, his knee was bent. I didn't know if there could possibly any, be any shortening in that leg. Um, I wanted to get him on his back to kind of assess for that. Um, there, were, there were no, like, large, obvious deformities. Um, I do remember doing... Uh, CMS in that foot where um, he was generally quite pale uh, of a person, fair skin, but it did seem pale to me. He he seemed pale to me in general. Um, the foot seemed pale. He he said he could not feel me touch his foot and he could not move his, his toes, um, but there was a good pedal pulse. And then when we were able to roll him, um, I was able to assess that there was no shortening. There was a bit of a, a bump kind of on his lateral thigh on that side, uh, and it was very tender. Okay, so he leg. says he's having some paresthesias or abnormal sensations, but he did have a good pulse, and nothing looked obviously broken. Yeah, no obvious deformities. Hip, hips were stable. Um, 
and no shortening or rotation. Okay. And then the vitals that you guys got, his heart rate was 110, so a little tachycardic, which could attribute to pain, I guess. And then blood pressure, 108 over 59, satting 91, a room air, normal respiratory rate, and normal normal blood sugar. So good assessment. Sounds like very thorough. And then I what a... That's uh, one benefit of working with Ben is, you know, he does really good thorough stuff. And, you know, if you're the officer, all you got to do is write it down. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, both of you guys do an exceptional job. So this, and this is um, one of the important takeaways from this case is a seemingly benign call, right? A young guy with um, some severe leg pain, but no obvious fracture. Um, what did you end up uh, doing for him in terms of interventions? Uh, so intervention wise, we were going back and forth with this, with the five, five crew because of his history. And he had told us that uh, he had taken his prescribed Xanax at some point. So we weren't sure exactly when. And the story of when all this happened was either nighttime or daytime. So there was a lot of conflicting info. Um, so we had to rule out fentanyl, I think. And so Ben and the 5-5 medic decided to go toward all route, um, try to ease that pain a little bit. Yeah, I think that's totally appropriate. We know it's uh, good for pain control and not necessarily a narcotic, so not an yeah. addictive substance. Yeah, we had also, you know, done an assessment on his pupils. We, we, you know, the 5-5 medic was a little bit suspicious of recent opioid use because they were they were pretty small. And, and he did appear slightly intoxicated. Obviously, we didn't. We weren't able to determine what he he had denied, you know, um, opioid use recently. Um and I, and I had a question for you, Doc. Sure. I know in our protocols, it is contraindicated to give both benzos and, and narcotics um, outside of very specific situations. If someone, if you're pretty confident someone has taken their own benzos, would you refrain from giving narcotic pain administration or would I you would feel like it's okay? very cautious about it because uh, there's a chance you could severely sedate them to the okay. point that they don't breathe. But if it's someone like with an obvious fracture or some intractable pain um, and that's really the most logical option to give a narcotic at that point, I would give it maybe just in a lower dose and then just watch very carefully. Okay, copy that. But, but yeah, so you guys had a patient here who was a little altered, severe leg pain, and was he able to ambulate to the gurney on his own, or did you guys? No, have to? no, we we mega moved him, um, and, and when he was first, you know, on his side, I was looking at that possible shortening, um, the 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 deformed, the small deformity, the little bump that I felt was kind of midline on his thigh, so. I was thinking like, oh man, are we going to break out the traction split here? And we turned him over and then we turned him over and, and it was, it was he not that. Um, but it was still severe pain, severe right. enough so, to yeah. where he couldn't ambulate. So we just, you know, in terms of, we didn't s splint it. We just mega moved him over to the gurney and tried to keep it supported throughout transport and all that, all that kind of stuff. Well, this was a super interesting case, and one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it, you have a, a patient here who, with a kind of questionable history, but with uh, an obvious severe um, problem uh, with his leg and severe pain to the point that you had to move him. He ended up actually being in full-blown rhabdomyolysis with a compartment syndrome in his leg, um, suspected probably because he was lying on the floor, his urine drug screen came back for um, methamphetamine, cocaine, benzos, as well as marijuana. So my guess is he probably had passed out on the floor at some point with his leg in a pretty awkward position. And this doesn't just happen in people that pass out. Sometimes it's maybe an elderly patient that falls and lands on the floor, but as they're laying there immobile, um, not moving, that, that pressure on those cells can burst those cells and cause a uh, rhabdo. And depending on the compartment that's involved, like, like this gentleman in the lower leg, there's not a lot of room to swell. And those um, compartments get to the point where they're cutting off, actually uh, can cut off blood flow, but the nerve, the paresthesia that he was feeling and the lack of sensation is because that nerve was compressed inside that lower leg and um, ended up being a pretty serious, um, he needed an ICU stay for this. Um, which is surprising, right? Nobody would ever predict that with a 22-year-old that's complaining of leg pain. Um, 
but he ended up being fine. Uh, they um, were able to flush out um, some of the cell death that had been occurring with a lot of fluids. Ultimately, though, his leg, um, some of the things you had picked up on in his physical exam, he did need uh, what we call fasciotomies to relieve those compartments in the leg to relieve some of the swelling to make sure that the leg uh, kept having blood flow. So... Um, have you, you've studied compartment syndrome, I'm sure before, right? <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> okay. The six we were, P's. The six P's. Me and Londo were going back and forth. Um, the CK level, which I believe is it's cre a creatine. Creatine kinase. Yeah. It's a, a marker kinase. of cell death that we can measure on the labs in the hospital. I remember when we got this back, we were looking at what normal is and, and it was like right around 150, right? Yeah. It was the high end of normal. Yeah. He's at 65,000. 65,000 times too high. <laughs> and that's just from his, his cells in his leg the dying, The cells in basically. the leg. And I think that's the knot that you felt on his thigh because he had more cell death going on, more than just in the lower leg. It's just the lower leg um, was more severe because it was trapped okay. in those compartments. But I suspect his his thighs as well, um, which is a large muscle group, had a lot of... Um, cell death as well. So given more time for this patient to be in that position, it would have eventually affected more the upper leg too and that yes. same compartment syndrome. Yeah, and okay. he was actually, anytime you get cell death like that, if he had, let's say he had laid on the floor for a longer period of time and you guys got there a little bit later, there's also potassium that's released um, when cells die and he could have gotten hyperkalemic and a little more unstable from the acidosis and the hyperkalemia that that causes with the toxicity to the heart. So... Um, kind of speaking on hyperk, I I know Ben and I had gone back and forth with this, like, uh, and he mentioned earlier about doing a 12 lead. What is that? Like, would we have seen anything noticeable? This, is, this is such a bizarre case. I don't think anybody would fault you for not getting a 12 <laughs> lead on a 22 year old with leg pain, right? Um, so hindsight's always 20, 20 and you can, what if it's a death? But I think you guys right. did excellent in terms of your assessment, assessment and treatment. Maybe um, if you have, but if you have lots of time. Probably, you know, I was thinking. Knock everything out. <laughs> I was thinking about this guy. The one clue that may have been that he was sicker than advertised initially would have been his capno may have been a little bit low. If you had thought to right. put a capno on him, which again wasn't really indicated here, but if you had put it on and recognized that it was a little lower than it should be, then you start thinking more metabolic problems. Right. And at that point, that is like next next level <laughs> thinking <laughs> um, hey, it's a good tip it's yeah. a good tip um capno is a really sensitive indicator of if there's ever a metabolic problem or something else going on great um and then anytime you're thinking about acidosis then you have to think okay what's the potassium level which would lead to a 12 lead but in this case definitely <laughs> <laughs> not indicated so at least initially for your initial assessment but yeah, those six, those six Ps. So he had, so those, that is something we can pick up on in the field, right? I think one of the things that you did that was excellent was actually look at the leg, feel the leg, check a pulse. Um, some of those simple things that, that are easy to overlook if it doesn't look like it's obviously broken. And he did, he had probably pain out of proportion to exam. Right? Definitely. Uh, Paresthesias. It was a little cool to the touch. But was a little cool to the touch. Kind of pale. And then not quite to the paralysis stage, but maybe Pretty close. close. And then the last thing to go is that compartment gets tighter and tighter would actually be the pulse. Okay. Um, so he was five of the six Ps, which is eventually what led to him needing those fasciotomies to lead, um, to leave some room for that blood flow to keep going to that foot. But Great. You guys did a excellent job. On so looking back on it, now that we know he had all these <laughs> things, <laughs> is there anything um, you want to share with people or you think you would do maybe different next time or? Or are really happy that you did this time? I think, like, what what came good of it was obviously, like, the full head to toe, you know. And there's stuff you don't find on, like, if you don't do that. So I think, like, rolling out the C-spine and then just kind of working your way down to where the pain was and uh, pedal pulses and stuff like that. So How about you, Ben? What are you going to take away from this call? Um, I think that just... Yeah, being compassionate and, and empathizing with our patients is the main thing. You know, even if we had done everything at 12 we might not have seen anything. Um, and 
we couldn't have fixed these problems <laughs> on scene. So listening to him, having compassion, being empathetic, and then treating it like it's real. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what Excellent I got. Job. Excellent job. Well, well done, you guys. Thanks, um, Doc. Good work. Thank you, Doc. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Hopefully uh, you got some little pearls to take away from this one. And if you have more cases you want to study, please feel free to submit those on SharePoint or reach out to anyone in the EMS division.